Hi, I'm Roseanne and welcome to my garden. You've just seen a video collage of our garden as it is today. It hasn't always been like that and it didn't happen all at once. Over the past 20 years or so, my husband and I have taken on four significant landscape design projects and countless smaller ones, all of which continue to evolve as gardens do. But by following a few simple design principles, which I'll cover in this video, this patchwork of projects has the look and feel of a well-planned and cohesive garden. In other words, while it's really nice to have a master landscape plan, it's not necessary to have everything figured out before you get started. To give you perspective, here's a bird's eye view of the garden layout of our property, as it looks today. It measures 50 feet wide by 200 feet deep, or roughly 15 meters by 60 meters. On the left of the screen is our front yard, with a curved walkway leading up to the main entrance of our house. Or, if you're heading to the garden, you continue on the side path to the arbor-covered entrance. Here you follow a meandering stone path in our narrow side yard garden, which eventually takes you to our backyard. Our backyard is composed of many smaller garden areas, all connected by a flowing, wide grass path, which encircles our center island garden. The symbols represent either trees, shrubs, or semi-permanent arbors and trellises. The tanned patterned areas represent natural stonework, and the white spaces are areas where I plant perennials and annuals. As we head to the back of the garden, we have a kidney-shaped flower bed and our latest project, a woodland garden. In the corner of our property, we have our garden shed and surrounding beds. The four larger landscape projects I mentioned were the front yard, the north garden, the garden shed area, and the largest project of all, driven by the loss of an enormous and beautiful elm tree most of our backyard and side yard. In this video, we'll focus on the first of the four landscape design projects, our front yard, because the front garden set the stage for the rest of our garden. I love going to gardens, and I always tell people to visit as many gardens as possible both virtual and in person, to understand what garden features they like and dislike. Personally, I love the casual, carefree feel of cottage gardens, the peacefulness of Japanese gardens, and the unpredictable and colorful pockets of wildflowers one comes across in the mountains. You can see all of those influences in my garden. My primary inspiration, however, was our very own house and this postcard my husband sent to me from Dorset, England. As soon as I saw this postcard, I knew the look I wanted. Most would agree that our house has a distinctly storybook feel. As we began building our own garden, I decided I wanted a garden that felt enchanted. Enchanted became our theme and it helped guide us in many of our garden decisions. Having a theme was particularly important for those long-term or enduring design decisions such as building our garden shed, selecting fencing, choosing trees and shrubs, and committing to hardscape materials. Although our theme was enchanted, other themes might be formal, wildlife friendly or pollinator friendly, sensory, tropical, or even a color palette such as white. Staying true to your theme and using consistent materials will help unify a garden that has been designed or installed over the course of many years. For our front garden, we needed to be clear on what we were hoping to achieve. Our theme will help decide how we accomplish it. I wanted to achieve great curb appeal. Specifically, my wish list included a welcoming walkway to our front door, complimentary foundation plantings and vines growing against the house, a tree or two because I like trees, and four season interest. Now 
Now that you know your theme or how you want your garden to feel and you've established your wish list, it's time to understand your space a little better. Before we get started on any landscape project, we make sure we have good measurements. Here's a 2021 version of a diagram of our front yard before we embarked on our first landscape project. Unless you know there are some things that you will not be keeping in your new design plan, it's best to record the placement and scale of all permanent elements, including buildings, fences, hardscape, trees, and shrubs. Lastly, don't forget to take note of how much sun your yard gets. This was our canvas from which to draw our plan. You can do this with either drawing software or paper and pencil. When we began years ago, we used tape measures for measurements and simple graph paper to make our landscape diagrams. As a tip, satellite images, if available, can be very helpful for recording placement of existing buildings and hardscape. To give you an idea, I use this satellite image of our entire property as it is today and augmented it with manual measurements, especially for trees, to draw this landscape diagram. When doing a garden design, it's tempting to want to start with the plants, but my advice is to start with the hardscape or the bones of the garden first. There's a reason that architectural elements such as pathways, fences, arbors, and other garden structures are often referred to as the bones of the garden. They help to frame and accentuate the living garden and provide definition and structure to the spaces. I think that good bones and repetition can calm an otherwise wildly diverse garden and keep it from looking higgledy-piggledy. I believe that's especially true in our garden. For our front yard landscape, I began by adding a walkway leading from the public sidewalk to our front door. I decided on a curved path. No straight lines for this enchanted garden. Wanting the front walkway to be unified in look and feel with the front entrance, I selected uneven, randomly sized, natural stone that matched the front steps and foundation of our house. Plentiful in our area and quarried in a neighboring state, we decided on Sandy Creek Sandstone. To soften the look of the hard-edged flagstones, I used Irish Moss or Sagina Subulata, planted between the pavers. This front walkway was the beginning of our love affair with a look of rustic, natural stone softened with luscious Irish moss. The other structural element I added was a curved bed to surround the ash tree. Trees do better when surrounded in a bed than surrounded by grass. It allows more moisture and nutrients to reach the trees. I also created beds lining each side of the stone walkway. We used stone edging to line the beds as both a practical matter and a visual one. While not foolproof, the edging helps stop creeping grass from invading our flower beds. The rustic looking edging stone we selected is Chilton Limestone from Wisconsin. It has orange hues that beautifully complement our sandstone flagstone path. These edgers, as they're referred to, lend just the perfect casual touch and can be easily moved if you decide to change the shape or size of your flower bed. We have since edged all of our borders and beds with these stone edgers. It's charming and helps to unify the garden. Vines and climbers are a key part of our landscape and certainly contribute to curb appeal. There's something so becoming about a house with vines growing against it, especially around the entrance. I think it makes the house seem friendly. As part of our front yard project, we had a wrought iron trellis made to fit the space to the left of the door. I think its curved design looks good, even without vines growing on it. Over the years, it's been host to many beautiful and interesting annual vines. <laughs> 
To the right of the door, we covered a downspout with a wire form made specifically for downspouts. I'm very happy to say that it would become a permanent host to our beautiful and hardy Jackmanii clematis. I think the vines definitely help with the enchanted theme I was looking for. Now that we have the hardscape, bed outlines, and vertical structures decided, it's time to begin selecting plantings. In addition to understanding your sun exposure and growing zone, it's also wise to know your soil. Our soil is sandy to medium and slightly alkaline with an average pH of 7.2. Other than staying away from plants that are truly acid loving, such as azaleas or rhododendron, I had a lot to choose from, even in zone 4. Let's start with the foundation planting to the left of the front entrance. Here are some scenes as it is today. Using different layers makes a landscape more interesting and I think increases its curb appeal. So in addition to the 8 foot trellis, I wanted a small tree, shrubs, perennials and ground cover. It keeps the eye busy. I also wanted to vary the foliage textures of the plantings. We began by selecting an ornamental tree that can be pruned to maintain its size. Isn't this a beautiful vanilla strawberry hydrangea? We didn't want a tree blocking our window, but we wanted the height. I don't think you can have an enchanted garden without roses, so we selected very hardy Henry Hudson roses. Part of the Canadian Explorer series, these shrub roses are hardy to zone 3. They're a lovely shade of white and an absolute pollinator magnet. I selected sedum for its summer foliage and rich fall color. Lastly, we transplanted ferns to fill out the space and Irish moss to blanket the ground. My next task was to plant the bed under the mountain ash tree. Because much of it was in the shade, I selected a combination of hosta, ferns, and for spring color, a lovely native dicentra or bleeding heart, all shade tolerant. A few years later, we removed the old ash tree due to disease and in its place planted a linden tree. This garden area continued to evolve and we are now left with a linden, three deep green yew, a chartreuse colored spirea, and a rotating display of annuals and perennials. We also planted a Japanese lilac tree on the other side of the path. I think it provides good balance and I like its structure. Initially, we lined the stone pathway with variegated hosta. Although it's quite lovely, I decided that I'd like more visual diversity, using a little more color and varying foliage textures. We widened the side beds to about two feet and dug up many of the hosta. When deciding how to plant the rest of the side beds, I knew I didn't want symmetry, but I did want balance. The hosta, now a mix of variegated and solid green, are clumped in no particular manner on each side of the pathway. I wanted a casual, almost haphazard feel to it. Some flowering perennials I added were Lady's Mantle, for its unusual leaves and chartreuse flowers, and Leotris. The purple spikes of the Leotris and its fine, almost feathery foliage is a nice contrast to the large leathery leaves of the hosta and as in this scene, calla lily leaves. In general, I like a full or abundant look in the garden, plus it keeps down weeds. So whatever space is left between the hosta gets allocated to annuals and bulbs. In spring, that's especially true for tulips. We always have tulips, some years more than others, but beautiful nonetheless. I find that hosta and tulips are perfect companion plants. We plant clusters of tulips of the same color in between hosta plants for a substantial and colorful display. The result is a charming mix of colors lining the walkway interspersed with the calming green of the emerging and still small hosta plants. Few scenes can create more curb appeal than a colorful display of tulips. 
When the tulips are fading, I plant either calla lily bulbs or bedding plants, such as begonias or impatiens, in between the tulip stems, taking care not to damage the plants. By the time the tulips are done flowering, there's plenty of other color just beginning. If you've seen other of my videos, you'll know I love calla lilies and repeat them throughout our garden. I always have a few large patches in our front garden. Callas are so unique and stunning. Most would agree that the flowers are beautiful, but I really like the foliage too. The leaves make the garden seem dense and lush. Gardens will always evolve. Our front yard certainly did. Thankfully, a garden is never done. A few years later, we enlarged our front yard design as part of a larger landscape project involving our side yard. Of greatest significance is that we created a garden entrance consisting of a narrow stone path and an arbor covered gate. I wanted the entrance to be exceptionally welcoming and enticing We've been growing blue moon wisteria on the arbor for at least 10 years now. It flowers abundantly and reliably for us every spring. I do prune it very hard in the fall and in the summer I make sure to clip back stems that might be reaching out too far. The bees also love its nectar. The narrow connecting pathway is made of the same Sandy Creek sandstone we used on the front walkway. And of course, I planted Irish moss in the cracks. At this same time, we replanted the entire foundation area to the right of the main entrance and got rid of more overgrown shrubbery. Because I wanted winter interest, evergreens were important. The tallest part of the foundation planting is the weeping white spruce tree, a perfectly enchanting and narrow tree for the space. I centered it on our chimney. Then I added some blue to the mix with a dwarf blue globe spruce. I added a burgundy green leaved Wygela called spilled wine for even more color and different texture. With the trees and shrubs decided, perennials were next and my first choice for a slightly mounded area was a beautiful hue of creeping phlox. It blooms early and generously as the abundance of direct southern exposure seems to agree with it. Utilizing some of our own plant divisions, I added these gorgeous, rich, yellow daylilies which bloom for about three to four weeks beginning in July. Other than some white cone flowers, all of the rest of the plantings, including ferns, hosta, and liatris, are repeats from elsewhere in the front garden. This helps the new area to blend seamlessly into the other established part of the front garden. We also repeated ladies' mantle, hosta, and liatras in the narrow side beds next to the new path. It's an incredibly low maintenance combination. The one plant that stands apart from the others is this red phlox. It draws attention to the garden entrance. I don't use red often in the garden, but I think it's perfect scattered here and there. Even though red tends to be a recessive color in the garden, I think it brightens and cheers up spaces. Before we wrap up this design project, I would be remiss not to mention using containers for creating curb appeal. This little pairing of pots adds new structure and texture, provides season-long color, and softens the hard edges of the house. This same general mix of color and flower varieties can be found elsewhere in our garden in similar clay pots. As with perennials, annuals, and hardscape, I believe that repetition is key toward getting a true, unified, and cohesive feel. Lastly, I think that enchanted gardens need a little whimsy. I'd like to introduce you to Sam Rabbit, welcoming visitors as they approach the front door. For us, Growing and expanding our garden has been a natural progression. Knowing our theme or how we wanted our garden to feel helped guide us through many significant landscape decisions. Then, by repeating plantings such as hosta, daylilies, or ladies mantle, and by repeating hardscape materials, our garden flows harmoniously from one area to another, old or new.
I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching.